Wow. All right, everybody. So today uh, is a very special day. And if you've been following us, you know today is Rare Disease Day. And uh, with Community Heroes, you know that we do three annual webinars. And this one being uh, the last one. And so we were lucky enough to have two wonderful representatives uh, join us. And I'm gonna you know, kind of uh, introduce them in a moment. Um, but be, uh, before I go into those things, I just want to talk about the house rules. If, if you're here listening, uh, you know, uh, whenever it's your, your turn, uh, please be respectful of others. There will be a Q and A for today's panel. Uh, please also uh, be courteous to our speakers whenever uh, you have an opportunity to speak to them, or even in your comments. If you want to speak, uh, the rule will be: you uh, raise your hand, and we will acknowledge you then. This, uh, our uh, webinar will be an hour and a half. Uh, now, uh, the Community Heroes, we uh, are a nonprofit organization here in Wayne County, and we are focused on uh, the special needs average population, raising awareness for them. And our objective is to create a society to where each individual can live equally. All inclusiveness is what we're striving for. Um, so this right here is just one aspect of how we're trying to do that. Uh, also, we put, we're planning on providing mentors. We want to uh, do a, a community events and uh, many more. So if you want to be a part of that, please contact us at our website, uh, www.communityheroes.net. Uh, now, without further ado, uh, I want to introduce our, uh, well, we had three, um, but uh, the third one had a family emergency. So I just want to say uh, thank you to uh, Sarah uh, for you know just working with us. Even though she's not here now, but she played a very big part into what we're about to do tonight. Um, so, and our, so our other two uh, panelists are Dr. K. She is the founder of the Epic foundation and our other individual is uh dr j that's a new name dr j uh and she is a representative for the muscular dystrophy uh, association uh the research and observer for the neuroscience department i i i, I think she'll probably correct me in the moment i won't let you two ladies uh give, give a more formal introduction Thank you so much, Tyrone. Um, my name is Dr. Karen or Dr. K. Um, I love that name. Um, so I am the founder and executive director of a 501c3 nonprofit organization called the Epic Foundation. And that stands for empowering people with invisible chronic illness. So we represent uh, a very marginalized group, which is uh, a population of folks who are not often seen, they feel unseen and they feel unheard because oftentimes people don't think that they look sick. So we provide support advocacy and tools to empower people with invisible chronic illness as well as their caregivers. And we do that by showing up for them in terms of advocacy, anywhere from helping with health insurance claims and denials to having a patient and support line where there are people who have gone through the journey who are able to be there for them and show up for them in a way that they might not feel like they're showing up for in other areas of their lives. I don't know if um, maybe I can get into my own personal journey a little bit later, but 
that's basically our organization and we're at www.epictogether.org because we believe that together we're epic. Do you want me to go ahead and uh, make a quick introduction, Tyrone? Yes. Uh, yes. yes, can you? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that was very hard to follow. Dr. K, you know, you're amazing. And, uh, and I do think, you know, Community Heroes is doing such a great thing. Just even having this platform to raise awareness um, and just having a dialogue with different kinds of people. Um, but I will try my best <laughs> to follow Dr. K's lead. Um, so as Tyrone mentioned, my name is Edrits Havalosa. Uh, you can also call me Dr. J or Edrits if you'd like. And I work for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Um, I'm actually very brand new still. I've, I've only been within, org within the organization for a little bit over a year. I really love the, the mission and the goal to support and help families and patients with neuromuscular diseases. And one of the things that, or many of the things that the organization does similar to EPIC is provide advocacy support, um, have educational resources, and, and really we have um, also the science team where we provide funding for research that help develop therapies um, and also as the observational research director, I get to work on our uh, patient registry, which is very different from other registries because we are able to leverage um, our, the clinics that we are already collaborating with um, that are participating in our programs. And also, um, you know, with this registry, it's clinic entered. And so I think it, it really uh, has a lot of potential to help identify gaps that we are missing in patient healthcare outcomes, um, just have a little bit more understanding of the development of different diseases and really to help accelerate drug development. And like Dr. K, I can also, you know, give a little bit more a uh, personal story kind of later today, um, mm. but if you would like to check out uh, the Muscular Dystrophy Association, you can go to www.mda.org. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, um, so I, I kind of like, would like to just uh, get our conversation started. I'm going to uh, You know, I, I reached out to you. Um, you know, I was like, well, man, my, I wonder what would be the best thing to talk about for rare disease. And I think we all came to a mutual understanding to where with rare diseases, uh, there's so many out there. Uh, according to Nord, I think there, there's, it, there's 300 million rare diseases that uh, we have no idea about, you know, the common individual. Uh, so, you know, w one thing I wanted to do was just talk about um, on that life experience how having one of these rare diseases um, it has affected our, our lives. And by you being here, Dr. J, you can kind of talk about uh, what the NDA uh, is doing to help uh, hopefully find some cures for some of these things. Uh, so, with with me for those who don't know i have uh i have my uh myerson deficient muscular dystrophy uh, and with myerson uh that's one of the main chemicals that's needed for muscle development uh so uh you know just having that and then on top of the condition being the atrophy meaning the deterioration of muscle it makes it like a double 
win because your producer people are uh, weakening. Um, and so I, um, with, with um, that, that, uh, um, Dr. K, I think the condition that you were going to speak on uh, was. So um, there, there are two conditions um, that have affected me personally, which include Cushing's disease and ironically on the other end of the spectrum, Addison's disease. And, um, you know, when I tell my story, I will speak to how that even happened, how I ended up from one to the other. But of course, um, as we also know with some of these illnesses, you know, there are residual things that happen too. So you might be diagnosed with one illness, but there's other illnesses that, um, you know, where there's a high comorbidity um, or it, you know, happens as a result of either having an illness or treatment for an illness. So technically, you know, we have a list on our website of illnesses that we support. Of course, we can't support all illnesses. And I say that on the website, but I currently live with 13 of those illnesses. So um, it's quite an interesting journey that I've had, but I would love to share a little bit more if I have time about what my experiences were with finding and seeking a diagnosis and how I got to this point in my journey. Yeah, yeah. so, so um, Dr. K, I want, if you want to, you can go take the lead on that story. I, I really just wanted to introduce what we we're going to talk about, sure. but I, I was going to let you go ahead and kind of take the lead and, uh, you know, if you want to kind of pause to ask me anything, I'm, I'm definitely here since we're going to have a conversational uh, time Okay, so um, yeah, I would I would love to share my story um, if you would like for me to do that now. Uh, uh, yes, and, uh, and then afterwards, I would love because I, I don't know anything about cushion disease. Yeah. That's for this. I I think I'm like everyone else. See, I'm I'm interested to learn about it and then I'm, I'm probably going to be like everyone else. I'm going to have some questions. Afterwards. <laughs> I love questions so go right ahead. Um, yeah so I you know I know I'm smiling now but as we all know when we're going through it when we're going through the journey we're not laughing right so but I can smile now because um, you know I think we all have the value of taking adversity and turning it into an opportunity to really do something impactful. So Tyrone, I just want to take the time to thank you again for allowing me to be here because I feel like this is part of my life's purpose is sharing my story. So I want to say that, you know, I earned my doctorate in 2005 in clinical psychology. At that time, I had a very small child who is now 18 and is uh, getting ready to go to college in the fall. I can't believe it, my baby. Um, and so my husband and I were, were a very young couple. Um, he's an engineer, so we were both in our careers. And we had a very small child, a family, you know, um, we had aspirations, all of that. Within a couple of years of graduating, I started developing very strange symptoms. And oftentimes with these strange symptoms, it can look like something else particularly with Cushing's disease, the most overt symptom, so that the symptom that you notice right away is unexplained rapid weight gain. And there's a reason for that that I will get into, but I gained 30 pounds in 30 days. So imagine gaining 30 pounds in a month. I don't think there's a physician out there who can logically say to anyone that diet and exercise are the culprit behind gaining 30 pounds in 30 days. I mean, I've worked with binge eaters and they were not gaining weight at the weight at the rate that I was. And I, at one point I was um, gaining weight at a rate of five pounds a week. So it was extremely alarming, but then the symptoms continued to pile on. And I had an onset of type two diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol. I developed a heart murmur. 
I developed GI issues. I developed random infections where I had to get minor surgeries because these infections would pop up. And the whole while we had no idea what was going on with me. And of course, anything that everybody else saw, they didn't see the diabetes, they didn't see the heart murmur, they saw me turn and morph into a completely different person in front of their very eyes. I was always pretty naturally thin for the most part and athletic and all of that. So I was slowing down. I visited a total of about nine physicians, including endocrinologists, and I was told the same speech. You're not working out hard enough. Uh, my well-trusted physician said, you need to run on the treadmill a little bit faster. And I said, well, how is putting it from six to seven speed gonna help me lose weight? He put me on weight loss drugs. I continued to gain weight and ultimately gained 150 pounds in less than two years. No one was able to give me answers. Everyone was looking at me like you just had way too much chocolate cake, which is why I'm totally against uh, food shaming to, to this day, because I became a strict dieter. I ate between 800 and 1,000 calories a day, and until my muscles started to atrophy, because that's another symptom, I was working out in the gym three hours a day with a personal trainer who accused me of lying on my food logs simply because everyone wants a logical explanation as to why this is going on. I miraculously became pregnant with my 10 year old daughter in 2010 because women with Cushing's are said to not be able to have children. And so now I had an older child. I was pregnant with my younger child. It was a very hard pregnancy. I was put on bed rest and my OB gyne, uh, OBGYN thought I was going to die. And she basically said, your only job is to have this baby. And so we were just so alarmed about what was going on with my body. Well, right before I had the baby, I came across an episode of a show called Mystery Diagnosis. Um, there are reruns on the Discovery Channel now, but it was on the Discovery Channel and it was a show that showcased rare illnesses. And one day I saw a rerun in 2010 from 2003 on Cushing's disease. And I couldn't believe it. All the check marks, just everything from, you know, the uh, psycho uh, emotional symptoms to the physical symptoms, everything checked off. But when I went to the endocrinologist who misdiagnosed me, he said, he went through a list of reasons why there was no way that I could have Cushing's because it was too rare. How many of us hear that? You know, the mm. folks that are with us on Rare Disease Day, they know that sometimes we've been told it's too rare for you to have it. And I told him, I'm not leaving your office until you start testing me. And he's like, well, I can't argue with that. My wife loves mystery diagnosis. Let's roll with it. And test after test, he, he couldn't believe it. I mean, he just could not believe it. Cushing's is caused by excess cortisol in the body. I don't know if you guys have seen these commercials about belly fat. And so most people associate cortisol. It's like, do you have a bunch of belly fat? Then you need to take these supplements for cortisol. That's what people associate it with. But cortisol is actually our stress hormone. It's our fight or flight hormone. It helps us compensate for physical and or emotional trauma and stress. Cortisol is a life-sustaining hormone. So it rises and falls depending on the time of day as well as the, the stressors in our lives, both good and bad. And when you have too much of it, it makes your body go haywire. I had 60 times the amount of cortisol in my body than is normal. Yeah. And it's, it would take too long to tell the story, but I um, am uh, from a Northwest suburb in Chicago. Even after uh, affirmative testing results, we had to find specialists in Seattle, Washington on the other side of the country at the Pituitary Center in Seattle in order to get help. Um, because what I didn't mention is that, you know, there are various reasons for Cushing's, but um, the most uh, prominent reason I would say is um, a tumor located 
in, in a part of your body. And for me, um, Cushing's disease indicates a pituitary tumor located on the base of your brain, size of the end of a pencil uh, tip, but it wreaks complete havoc and causes the adrenal glands to produce way too much of the cortisol. Um, I was functional for a few years um, with, you know, before the diagnosis, and it seemed like um, not too long after receiving an official diagnosis, things just changed in a blink of an eye. I became completely bedridden. I um, was not able to walk without assistance when I did finally walk. Um, and I was knocking on death's door. Um, so I had brain surgery in Seattle in 2011. And quickly I will say, just for those who are wondering how in the heck did I end up with Addison, after a recurrence of the disease, um, about a year after I had brain surgery, uh, the disease came back and we did some testing and it was discovered that I have tumor cells floating around there. So just one active cell and not just a concrete tumor would cause the disease to come back. Um, in these rare instances, they do something that's pretty, you know, um, dramatic and go straight for the adrenal glands. And so in 2013, I had both of my adrenal glands removed, which put me into a state of Addison's. And Addison's, which is a type of what's called adrenal insufficiency, is when the body does not produce enough cortisol to live. And so my body does not produce any cortisol at all. So I went from one extreme to the other. It is ironically another life-threatening illness, but it was done because it was the illness that I guess was, is considered more manageable for those who are in the Cushing's community. Because with Cushing's, I couldn't control how high my cortisol would rise. With adrenal insufficiency, I am dependent on medical steroids to replace my cortisol. Unfortunately, during times of stress, if I don't replace it enough, I can go into what's called an adrenal crisis, and those can lead to fatalities as well. So when I tell you I've been through it, I have been through it. The journey felt really lonely for my husband and I, um, eventually raising two girls and trying to figure this whole thing out and navigate the world. And um, even though I had been in private practice as a clinical psychologist for quite some time and had to leave abruptly, I decided in 2016 to incorporate empowering people with invisible chronic illness. Most people call it the Epic Foundation because I didn't want other people to feel alone in their journeys when they're seeking a diagnosis and they don't know where to turn and people are judging them and people think they're making stories up in their minds and they just feel completely unheard and unseen. I wanted to have an organization that can provide that soft place. So we're based out of Chicago, Illinois, uh, one of the suburbs out of Chicago, but we're really a national and even an international organization where we um, are able through virtual means to service people even from Canada and, and other countries around the world. So I know that that was a lot, but thank you for listening to my story. Yeah, uh, man, you got so many points that I would love to, to reach out. So I'm going to try not to ask all the questions, at least the questions for the, for the, uh, the uh, attendees, but uh, one, some of the things I love that you just pointed out was uh, especially the 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 invisible uh invisible disabilities that we are so often unaware of that have dramatic uh effects on our body and just your story of how you had to navigate for one diagnose your own self you know diagnose your own self and then you know go along and still function and work and often a lot of individuals had no idea that it was probably all you could do just to get up some days uh, with your condition and you know I, I just want the individuals who are listening now that you know so often we go out in public 
Walmart, McDonald's, Burger King, whatever. And, you know, we see individuals and they look, quote unquote, fine like us. And we don't know that, you know, their story like yours, that, you know, these individuals have possibly been close to the family. Uh, so I think it was, it was very important to hear your type of story with an invisible disease that really is, uh, has really took you through the ringer, uh, you know, compared to, to mine, uh, you know, which mine could uh, show its lifespan with muscular dystrophy, you know. Uh, my, 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 me and my wife was talking about it earlier, uh, you know, life expectancy and marriage and stuff, and I think when muscular dystrophy, uh, the lifespan, I think the oldest living person was like 53 with it. So we were talking about lifespan and stuff, but again, I guess the point I'm getting to is a lot of times individuals, they get it more when they see the physical, you know, for somebody then compared to, like you just said, someone that those, those invisible disabilities, a lot of times we just don't know. Uh, you know, the, the the story behind them, the struggle. And that's why I'm so happy that you decided to come up with the Epic Foundation to, uh, you know, to help these individuals that may have these invisible disabilities. Uh, so I, I guess I, I'm going to kind of share my story a little bit and then uh, we'll roll on to uh, Dr. J and then we'll see what uh, get the individuals uh, a little bit of time to ask their, their questions. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, with my condition, it's uh, Myerson uh, deficient muscular dystrophy, and uh, I'm, I'm with me. I, I've been married uh, about eight years now, and uh, when we have a four-year-old, so and I'm married a little bit later. Uh, my birthday is July the fourth, so I'm, I'm getting close to forty. So they can give you an idea. I'm, I'm an older dad, but um. You know, I, I've you know my condition is genetic, so you know, for long as I long as I can remember, I've I've had my my condition, but um, I was from early on, I know I was kind of different for as mentality was. Uh, here in Wayne County, we our special needs population it gets adequate support. I think in school we really have for uh, special needs. Uh, I went there and, uh, you know, just, they thought I had a mental disability for, for a while. And uh, so after a while, I mean, being there and being tested more, we realized that my condition wasn't really mental. It was just physical. So I kind of got out of there and they kind of moved me to a school setting that was more fit for me. And uh, so I came up in a traditional classroom setting early on, which is, is important. I bring that up because so often with self-identification, we identify with what we're around. And I think me being in a traditional classroom setting did a lot for my uh, self-esteem while I was coming up. Uh, so in the school system, I was in a regular classroom setting and I had friends and I was pretty much, I guess, the popular kid, you know, I did all the school stuff but some of the things that it was tough on me was um you know the, a lot of time there wasn't really proper activities for me to do you know um and you're right then you're watching everybody run around or doing you no know, playing basketball and you're kind of on the sideline so you had i had those things i dealt with my parents uh they really what they didn't know too much about my condition uh, so there was multiple trips to UNC hospital to to get educated and and things like that. But uh, and another thing, I'm, whenever you grow up in uh, a lot of time low income areas, you know some of the individuals around you they will try to educate you on things, but they really not educate themselves on it. So uh, there was a lot of miss miss. It. Uh, information that went on too, um, but luckily I, no, that didn't affect me too much. Um, but I think my real, my what I think really started changing my life was um, 
once I got to the high school area and uh, me just trying to get out of high school and uh, the turning point in my life was my senior year when it was time to figure out what I was going to do. And I also had no idea what I was going to do. Uh, you know, uh, I just I was just, I was disabled and, you know, I, my parents really didn't talk to me about what I was going to do. And um, they loved me, but it was my parents, you know, they had their own issues going on. And uh, so they, I didn't have that talk. But I had a VR counselor come at the last moment and try to get me in the school and my grades weren't high enough then to get into North Carolina State. I say North Carolina State, I didn't want to go there. But it, was, but, uh, but I, it wasn't high enough to go there. And so I went to the community college here in Goldsboro. And uh, that's where I got my associate degree in human services. And from there, I found out that my passions where I am naturally talented to talk to people. And people would tell me stuff, I don't even know who they are. They want to tell, they'll tell me about what their life story, the first time they fell in love, and then, and they'll tell me how great a person I am. And, you know, and I, I mean, I think I t it's, that's a talent to be able to, to have people to feel comfortable to talk to you. Uh, but I knew that was my calling. So you now I went on and got my, my bachelor's in sight, but during this time, you know, my mom, I, me being the same, I had my obstacles. Uh, my mom was there with me the whole time. For every degree I've gotten, my mom was there for me. And she came in because funding, they won't pay if you're disabled. No, you can't, you can't get an attendee to follow you to go, uh, to go to like classes. If you got a doctor's appointment, you can get, Medicaid, stuff like that, you get an aid for them to take you to a doctor's appointment or grocery shopping. But if you're trying to get a degree or go to a job, you can't get an aid for that if you're disabled, which is those are some things that at least here you can't, you know, and, uh, you know, some of the things I couldn't do because of the curvature of my, my back, which muscular dystrophy does uh, often because the muscles get to the point they're so weak that you, I call it sway back. And I may, it may be, it may not be the proper name, but that's what I call it, the sway back. But the, a lot, your muscles cannot properly support your, your rib alignment. Uh, so often surgeries have to be done to fix the curvature in the neck or the back. Um, because they say that's one, one of the main reasons for uh, death, uh, for individual muscle this because their airways become uh, impact uh, because of that. So, and my so my mom she went. I, I took night school for my bachelor of psychology twice a week, and she was there the whole time with me to make sure uh, I got there. But luckily, when I got my master's, I did that online and stuff. Um, but along those those ways, you know, when I was getting my my degrees, I had to learn how to not let my disability, uh, you know, be a something that hold, held me behind, you know, because uh, there was plenty of time I, I felt tired, you know, my body ached. Um, I can't actually, I've actually been pretty blessed. I haven't been on a lot of medications or had surgeries, but it's just the, the really the muscle weakness had took, took a toll. I never, I never always sit like this. Uh, from middle school, I used to sit, I used to sit straight up. And at one point, I actually had more hair on my head, and like, but then the you know, puberty hit and then it started falling out. Um, but um, I, I, after I got my master's, another thing that I faced was, and this is my opinion, was um, the I'm gonna say I, I think I feel like there was an unseen discrimination of employment because when you try to look for a job and you always know you had that question, do you have a disability? And you had to ch check it off, and I, I always would wonder. I'm like, man, I said I got ten years of education in the psychology field. My grades are exceptional. I'm well known in the community. 
you know, I shouldn't be getting turned down for a front desk job. You know, and I mean, for everything, telecommunication. I mean, that's, that this is another issue that our our organization wants to address. Talking to businesses about these uh, un uncontradicted uh, discrimination that they may have whenever they see disabled. A lot of times, first thing that comes to mind is expenses, accommodations, extra training, things like that. Um, so I always wonder, like, man, I can't get no job. So I actually volunteered. And that's how I got my first job. And uh, I volunteered for eight months. And uh, But during that time, uh, th there was things. See, I, I need assistance out of my chair because I can't stand uh, straight up. And if I walk, I walk very slow. So um, and to, before I met my wife, I would go to volunteer to work. And sometimes I had to ask people, would you mind to come with me? Because I needed help to the restroom. You know, if I fell down on the floor, who would pick me up? You know, uh, and sometimes I would have someone to go with me. Sometimes I wouldn't. So I would train my body, you know, so if I drink anything, you can't drink no more. So you can go at least four hours without having to use the restroom until you got home. Uh, and, I, and I did that. Then I finally got employed. But uh, from that point on, I've worked in the community college system for over a decade. Uh, I was an achievement coach for like five years. And I did that. Uh, and wore, uh, wore like employee of the year with uh, with a disability. Then I've joined the mayor's committee for person with disabilities here. Got the member of the year for that. Um, now I met my wife in 2013 uh, and we've been married, but we traveled all over the place. You know, Philadelphia, all the way down to Florida, been on a cruise and things like that. Uh, but, and one of the main points that I want I'm making here is, you know, with with the rare needs of muscular dystrophy, um, there are a lot of areas that causes you no know, blocking. But uh, if you can get one person to you can trust, it does have to limit you know the out the the, the, uh, the outlook of life that you you have. Um, so I, I thank my wife so much for. Just being informed and allowing me to go and advocate and to uh, do a lot of things. Um, now I'm trying to, uh, for symptoms uh, by, like I said, by my condition being um, genetic. Some of the early on symptoms, if if individuals thought that their child might have some kind of muscular dystrophy, for one, a lot of times going to be the formation of the of the child when the child comes out it may be stiff like because uh with muscular dystrophy some of the signs are stiffness uh meaning that um uh, your muscles will contract and you know, my mind's contract i can only open my arms out to like 45 degree angle so and i to give you an idea what that would be if you would raise your arms straight up in the air Mine would probably go only halfway, so it would look like a a V in the air, uh, you know, because the muscles are so tight, and I it's I don't care how tight how hard you pull on them. I mean, they're they're locked in there. You had to break that muscle. That's how tight they are. Um, so you have contractions, and again, like I said, you have a lot of times stiffness. Uh, so. If you have uh, bouts of men in one place for too long, muscles often get stiff and numbness occurs. Um, for me, I've noticed that uh, as I got gotten older, um, because of the way I sleep, sometimes I wake up with headaches often. Uh, sleep apnea is always an issue with, uh, with it because of the <clears throat> difficulty in breathing. And um, those are the really the main signs that um, 
I didn't think that that person would have. Um, and another thing is um, um, their your muscle control. So with um, the muscle control like of your mouth, a lot of times the muscles get weak and so you you may uh, see like an excessive slobbering or uh, slurring of words. The words may not come out uh, as uh, as needed. So, uh, but yeah, and and as of right now, um, my um, my um, my um, organization, Community Heroes. Like I said, we um, we try to work not only with uh, individuals who may have my condition, uh, but really just anyone who. Uh, find themselves at risk um, because I, well, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Maybe what, I mean, the reason last time I finished up by saying the, what caused me to create Community Heroes was uh, out of all of the years of my work experience, there was a point first where I felt like I still had talents that weren't being utilized uh, from the jobs I had. Uh, because, like I mentioned before, I have been an achievement coach. I, I've been a, a mentor, a male mentor for for a while. I've done adjunct teaching uh, at the university level for psychology courses. And, you know, and I enjoyed every bit of it, but I felt like uh, my true uh, calling needed to be somewhere full-time where I was really making some executive decisions that could make some major changes in my community. Um, so that I finally, after talking to my wife and really just thinking about it, um, I'm really about about three years ago, I, I started thinking about trying to do a uh, nonprofit organization. And uh, I don't have no business background, but I started reading and coming up with ideas and everything. And finally, uh, in two, 2019, um, beforehand, I started thinking, like, what are some things that I love to do? Because I, I had so many ideas, and finally, I felt like God just told me the three things I love to do. I love to mentor. I love to help out, you know, special needs population. And... I love to just uh, just make a difference in my community. You know, be uh, be seen as a leader for change. So that's kind of how well, how community heroes came about. Uh, just me finding three passions that I have and trying to find out what can I do. And, and everything that I we do are part of what I've been trained in. You know, mentoring. Uh, advocacy and uh you know just uh spreading knowledge about different uh disabilities through our our youtube channel so i feel like i just i did what i did i what i know naturally and put it together yeah so at, at this point i think I, I talked enough uh dr j i'm gonna let you uh kind of chime in here Sure. Um, thank you both, uh, you know, for sharing your stories. Um, I had no idea about Cushing's either, Addison, and I'm learning more about myosin deficient muscular deficiency, um, as since that is a congenital muscular dystrophy, and so those uh, that's one of the neuromuscular diseases that you know falls under the umbrella of diseases that MDA covers. Um, but I just wanna say you are both very inspirational and I just love the fact that you don't let these challenges 
that you are facing with stop you from doing what you want to do. And that's just really admirable. Thank you. Um, to kind of just uh, touch on a little bit on uh, what MDA has done um, in terms of the services that they provided and also funding. Um, so MDA is an umbrella organization that supports 43 uh, diseases in the neuromuscular, neuromuscular space. Um, and, you know, with MDA, it's been running for 70 years. And it's very, very, very fortunate that we are, you know, able to have that kind of ability and capability to keep running and provide funding and support and resources to patients and families with neuromuscular diseases. Um, so I just kind of want to highlight, I guess, in terms of the different uh, resources that we have at MDA. So we work with, you know, over 150 uh, care centers in top uh, institutions. And within those 150 care centers, there's about 2,400 clinical providers and experts that really know about neuromuscular diseases. And then on top of those, uh, the care centers, we also have people in our organization who work in the resource center and you know have neuromuscular disabilities so they are able to connect with our patients and also provide our organization on you know their experiences as well so we can better support the community we are supporting and we also have the advocacy team and uh, our advocacy team really advocates for national policies and programs that will help accelerate therapy development um, facilitating early diagnosis. So for example, the newborn screening program, uh, which now screens for spinal muscular atrophy and also um, Pompeii disease um, for newborn babies. And then there's also focused uh, access to genetic testing and drug development uh, meetings and really increasing federal funding for research within this, uh, within this space. And, you know, the, so that's kind of like one component of MDA. And then the other is focused on the science. And so really funding research to help drive uh, finding therapies and treatments and, you know, drug development. Uh, so MDA has actually uh, funded over a billion dollars of funding into research and uh, I think now we have, we've helped 12 medicines, uh, you know, go into market in the last five years. So uh, very recently, uh, Sarepta, a pharmaceutical company actually just announced um, their new drug for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is another muscular dystrophy that affects boys and and so, so, you know, there's really a lot of exciting things in terms of like drug development and therapy development. And we are just very fortunate to be able to provide help in terms of funding in those areas. Um, another thing that I had mentioned earlier was the creation of the data uh, registry, the patient registry. And so this is really something that we are putting a lot of effort into just because there are so many um, kind of like components that we can incorporate in the future uh, and really has a lot of value in terms of learning best practices for clinical care that can help guide physicians and other clinical providers, you know, what was working um, how can they better the care that they're giving their patients and families and uh, other things that we're looking forward to do as well with our registry is to be able to partner with other uh, registries that has already been established and have been collecting, you know, data from patients themselves, um, 
and and really combining like you know what what is the data telling us what are the trends that we're seeing um, how can this help patients have better health outcomes because in the end that's what we're striving striving for so that we can really help support you know our patients and families have a better quality of life um, and so that's one of the things that I'm really excited about because as, as a nonprofit, I think there's really a lot of passion from the team members within the organization. And also, you know, there's a lot of community that's being built. And, and it, an example of, uh, for us to really learn is to hear voices from our patients and families. And, and I, I would say like, this is a part of that platform Right, for me to like really truly understand what our families and patients are experiencing. So um, if you haven't heard of MDA, I encourage you to reach out. Uh, the more voices we hear, the better we can help support. And again, if uh, you need the, the, the website, it's mda.org. And I'm so sorry for my, <laughs> I have shadows everywhere <laughs> on my face. You know, I try to position my, my, my desk so that it, the light wouldn't be shining on my computer, but I, I just have windows everywhere <laughs> and I cannot escape it, unfortunately. Yeah, that's fine. You know, we just give a little abstract feel. That's all. It's, uh, but thank you so much, uh, Dr. J, for just sharing that information. Um, so at, at this point right here, um, I'm going to uh, open the floor up to uh, individuals who want to ask us questions. So what we'll do is uh, if you have a question and you're on the attendee side, uh, if you hit, there should be like a raise hand button. And uh, if you, you hit that, I'll hit the allow to talk so you can uh, say, if you have something to say or ask a question, you'll be able to. And don't, don't anybody ruin it at the same time. <laughs> Hold on, I think, I think not that. I think uh, Leah on the, this is that, okay, okay. Let me, let me, uh, so Miss uh, Weathers, uh, you should be able to, uh, She's nine. I don't know if she can hear. Can you hear me, Miss Withers? Result of fetal rubella. Heart problems, hearing impairment, any number of developmental issues. But I feel like she understands. <laughs> Hello. Yes, ma'am. Hi, hi. I'm. I'm thoroughly enjoying the the presentation. Um, but I had a question of you and Dr. Karen. I actually work with Dr. Karen, and I was wondering, with you both having um, children and young. children, well, how do you go about explaining your illness to your children and helping them to navigate explaining um, their parents having an illness to maybe their their uh, friends? Yeah. Um, well, for me, my my son is uh, he's 
he's four, so I I had I try to keep in mind that I know right now his mind can't really process a real in depth explanation. But uh what I tried to what I'm trying to do right now is I tell him that, you know, we have differences. Um now I'm I'm a Christian. So when I when I talk to him, I tell him that uh, you know, God made has made everyone different and we're all unique. And uh, I, I let them know that being different is not bad. Uh, and then I go on, there's different characters. Luckily, thank God, society has gotten to the point to where we're starting to see the disabled population in the media a little bit more. So there's cartoons and things like that that actually have uh, characters in wheelchairs. So I, I tried to uh, bring those figures up and explain to him that Remember, you know, the character you saw on Paw Patrol or you know, wow. we, we uh, his last birthday, he had a little uh, BMX figure. There's a BMX uh, uh, BMX rider. Um, his name is Aaron For Fordham, but uh, he, he's got to deal with Hot Wheels and he got that for his birthday, the, his wheelchair. And uh, I told him, I said, you remember Aaron? And and, uh, and I bring this in to let them know that you know, uh, you know people are in wheelchairs for various reasons, and uh, wow. to at least let him know that you know, wow. uh, you no, know, you're gonna encounter people in wheelchairs, and and I let him know that I, I can't, I need it because I can't walk. Um, so he doesn't know the exact reason why, but he just knows he knows that I am in one, and that you know other people are. You may see other people in wheelchairs too. Um, and, and I guess a little bit whenever I, I think when he gets a little bit older, maybe uh, when he gets to the point where he starts maybe kindergarten, and I think his mind is able to understand a little bit more about uh, genetics and, and things like that a little bit better, then I'll actually explain to him about you know, you know genetics and when you're born this happens and, and that happens, but right now I, I think it may be a little bit too much overwhelming for him if I get too right. detailed with it. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, um, Tyrone. I really um I really enjoyed hearing your perspective about um, you know, how to um really help your children through this. Um and I, I will say that, um, you know, I, I, I agree with a lot of what you said and, and, can, and a lot of that resonates with me. Um, first of all, Maria, thank you for being here. As she said, Maria um, is with the Epic Foundation and she's our director of member services. So shout out to you. Thank you for everything that you do for the chronic illness community. Um, but I, I want to say just really to speak to that is, number one, I've always taught both of my girls ages 10 and 18 now that there's power in our stories and there's power in our voices. And um, Dr. J, you spoke to that when you talked about hearing the voices of the people who are reaching out because their individual stories are so very important. And so I always try to put a very empowering spin on or, or, or create the narrative in an empowering way where they understand that there is adversity sometimes that occurs in our lifetime, but, and we can't change the details of that, but the way that we tell the story uh, is what's impactful. And so I've always taught that to them. The second thing is having a mantra in our home that has been influential. And our primary mantra is never, never, never give up, a quote by Winston Churchill. And so I've always taught them that no matter what, if you fall a million times, it's not the falling that determines your success, it's getting back up that is the measure of success. So that is the second thing. But in terms of just concretely getting them to understand my illness, my eight-year-old daughter, I'm sorry, my 18-year-old daughter rather, was um, eight years old when I became completely non-functional. Uh, my, my children are eight years apart. 
So for my youngest, this is all she knew. So for my youngest, as she was growing up, we were doing homework from the bed. We were watching movies from the bed. I was getting help from my late mother and, uh, and my mother-in-law. They would come over daily. My mother-in-law would travel 60 miles to come help out. And so that's all she knew. Uh, psychologically, at the time, my eight-year-old over the years had a really difficult time adjusting because I was what they call a boss mom. You know, I was in private practice several hours a day. I was, you know, managing the household and, you know, just uh, I'm a type A personality. So, I, you know, I was just like making sure everything was in place. And it got to the point to where we as a family learned that life is very or can be very unpredictable. So my type A personality had to go out the window because we didn't know what was going to happen from day to day. There were years where I had seven hospitalizations in one year. So for me, they saw it. And it was important to me to be very transparent, age appropriately transparent. But it was important for me to explain at their level what my illness was. And then through my progressions, you know, what, what occurred to make me have another you know, illness that is life threatening. Um, and, you know, I was explaining um, before this webinar that, um, you know, oftentimes you'll have an illness that will result in residual illnesses. And um, we have a list of about 70, 80 illnesses on our website. And I have been diagnosed with 13 of them to, um, officially. Um, as a result of having had Cushing's and then Addison's disease. And so they've been through it. And, and for me, being very open about what's going on, their father, my husband, explaining to them, okay, this is what happens in the case of an emergency and things of that nature has been extremely important because I have found personally that when you try to hide things from the kids, and of course it has to be age appropriate, but I've met so many people who are like, no, I just want them to think I'm healthy. That's what's going to make them more resilient. And I'm out here saying that is not true in my experience because they want to know the truth. Children are very intuitive. They're tapped in. And when you hide things from them, in my observation, it makes them more scared. And so... Um, I would say those are the three things that have really helped me in my household, um, creating uh, an empowering narrative, having a mantra that we can um, always lean on, and being fully transparent within our family about what's going on. This is some kind of sick joke so you can calm down. Tell me what he found the car bomb. The is security. Okay, so, uh, uh, Tyrone, I saw that Leah had asked a question about Cushing's. Yeah, I wanna, uh, hello. Hello. Okay, hello. Yeah, uh, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, I was gonna click over and let Leah uh, speak. Okay. Okay, can you see now? Can y'all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Tyron, you knew I would chatter if I didn't have it turned off. <laughs> All right. So, um, Dr. K, I had a question for you about cushions. I know that sometimes it can be that when you affect ACTH, it can affect cortisol as well and aldosterone too. Um, some of the weight gain, was it really water weight? Did it go away quickly when you were done? When you were diagnosed and treated? So um, that is a loaded question. Thank you for asking. So you're right. There's um, with pituitary based Cushing's, um, there is a hormone called ACTH. Um, it is actually the excess of that hormone that causes the excess of cortisol produced by the adrenal glands, which are located on top of the kidneys. 
Um, so in that particular type of Cushing's, um, cortisol uh, is the thing that's impactful. Well, with all types of Cushing's, it's cortisol, but there are some people who have tumors directly on their adrenal glands or in an ectopic source on their lungs or somewhere else. But in my particular case with Cushing's disease, which is the subtype of Cushing syndrome that I had, um, yes, uh, that hormone uh, created problems with excess cortisol. Now, water weight really isn't a thing. Um, it really is hard to explain, but because a lot of people see the excess rapid weight gain, they're like, where is this coming from? It truly is the excess of cortisol that directly impacts the weight gain. Um, as far as aldosterone, many Cushing's patients, um, especially pituitary Cushing's patients, do not necessarily have issues with their aldosterone. And aldosterone, what it does is it helps to balance potassium and sodium and so that helps you with your blood pressure. Um, people with uh, adrenal-based Cushing's might have more difficulty with their aldosterone, but because of my particular journey, where I went from having Cushing's to adrenal insufficiency or Addison's, which is my subtype of adrenal insufficiency, because I no longer have adrenal glands, I'm no longer able to produce the hormone aldosterone. And also people with organic adrenal insufficiency may also have aldosterone deficiency. So it causes them to have to be on replacement medications. So I'm also on a replacement uh, type of steroid that replaces my aldosterone and helps me to balance my blood pressure. Otherwise my blood pressure would drop suddenly and that would put me into a, what's called an adrenal crisis. So it can be, you know, very complex. As far as weight loss, what I will say is that, um, you know, after treatment, that's one of the things that people hope will resolve right away. Um, I did lose weight because I had gained up to 150 pounds. And so at one point I lost about a hundred pound or so pounds of that. Uh, unfortunately, like I said, because of my particular situation with me being dependent on medical steroids and for people with Addison's in the community or adrenal insufficiency who are steroid dependent in order to live, those steroids, ironically, even though they keep you alive, they also wreak havoc on your body and can uh, mirror some of those pushing like symptoms, including weight gain. And so over the years, you know, I had my adrenals removed in 2013, but over the years, my weight has fluctuated depending on where I'm at with the journey. Um, the last thing I'll say about that is when you are facing stressful times, there are times you have to do what's called a stress dose regimen where you have to take more steroids than your baseline dose in order to deal and in order to avoid having an emergency situation where you now have to be treated on an emergency basis. And this pandemic, um, I'm sure we'll speak to that, has taken a, a real toll. It's been very traumatic. And there are many times where I have had to replace my cortisol levels um, otherwise uh, I, I um, am at risk for crisis and have gone into crisis. And so my weight happens to be more up this time. So it, it's just, it's, um, and then, you know, the residual illnesses, um, hypothyroidism as a result of pituitary surgery, um, you know, growth hormone deficiency, aldosterone deficiency, that all affects your weight and other physical symptoms as well. So that's why we, focus on the word chronic and try to help people understand that this is not, this does not follow a, a quote unquote normal course of illness where you get a diagnosis treatment and then recovery. There's a fluctuating pattern of illness where, you know, you're managing it for a lifetime. I hope I answered your question, Leah. Um, thank you, Dr. K. You answered thoroughly and um, thank you. 
I apologize if that was a little bit of an invasive question. I just was, I'm, a, I'm an um, anatomy and physiology instructor, and I like to kind of tie in things so they can learn one day when they're nurses what symptoms to look for. So I appreciate your thoroughness in answering that. Um, Dr. K, I had another I'm question an for book. you. I'm an open book, so you can okay. <laughs> Thank you. Want. All right. Thank you. I had another question for you. How has your rib disease affected your psychological um, practice as a psychologist? Has there been any influence? Has there been anything that maybe that's changed over the years for you? Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, you look at things from a much different lens, even having had the educational background that I had, you know, I had never experienced, I, you know, I have experienced trauma, but I had never experienced um, physical or medical trauma in this way. And ironically, I specialize in trauma. And so I had, you know, worked with very traumatic cases um, over the first few years of my career, um, including some medical trauma. And I, I want to say that looking back, I was compassionate and I was empathic and I was, you know, um, I tried to develop a sense of connectedness and relatedness. But having gone through the journey, I can say that I understand it from the, the trauma of, of going through this and the psychological impact um, is just. I'm so much more connected with right now. And so it really informs um, how I approach uh, my clinical work. Um, so yes, it's, it's been extremely impactful. And um, I actually left private practice out of necessity for a few years. I was in you know, my office one day and the next, it seemed like the next day I was having these weird blackout several times a day um, based on the change in tumor activity, it turns out, but I didn't know that then. So I went from going in to having to abruptly stop seeing my clients. I was devastated, absolutely devastated. And, um, you know, when I founded the organization, though, it was very important to me that we understood the mental health aspect and that we also really emphasize that we want to um, engage these members and these patients about their psychological journey um, that I know Tyrone is very much, you know, um, connected with as well in terms of understanding the person's psychological journey with all of this. Thank you. Thank you. And so with let me look back and see. Do we have any anyone else wanted to ask a question? Um, okay, so I, I'm thinking. I'm thinking uh, if that's it, uh, I just want to say uh, before I, have I get a question off. For for you, Tyrone and Dr. K. If, okay. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, Tyrone. No, uh, you're before fine. we ended. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I kind of just want to ask you both: What would be your advice to someone who is not experiencing any types of disability? Um, because there is this, uh, and I think Tyrone, you might have touched on it earlier. If you see someone who has a disability you're kind of like afraid to ask because um, you're afraid that you might ask the wrong questions. And so for me, I just kind of want to know like, what is the best way to approach to kind of learn, you know, from someone who is experiencing uh, either it's an invisible disability versus a visible disability? Um, well, I I don't know. I guess I'll, I'll since I'm already on mute, I I get my perspective on that. Um, no, it's now with the way things are now, we have so many new options. Because at one point, I think the hesitation was before we had different uh, organizations like my organization and Dr. K's organization and all of these different avenues online. You know, that it's 
you know, there wasn't before there wasn't all these opportunities. So the only way you could educate yourself, especially on a rare disease, was you had to have an encounter. You know, you had to a lot of times encounter someone with that rare disease, and it was more confrontational, personal, because you had to ask them face to face. And I think, you know, like you said, that made people hesitate. Um, so, but now, with the way things are, I would say, you know, you could easily go online and Google um, organizations or something like that. And a lot of these organizations nowadays are disabled owned. Uh, so they have someone on, on the uh, organization who has a disability that may be what you want to know about. You could actually email them and say, hey, you know, I, my name is Dr. J. You know, I'm interested in muscular dystrophy. Uh, could I correspond with someone in your organization about this? And you could, you know, they would contact you back. You could talk with them. That's one avenue. Uh, if you are someone who is not te technologically savvy, uh, I would say, um, Maybe you can find someone in in your community, like here in in our community. Uh, like I said, I'm a member of the mayor's committee, uh, so you know we have a, a group of representatives who are in tune with special need population, and you can uh, you know find out if you have that in your town. And I would say, you no, know, be a part of that organization so you can ask these questions. Uh, and then lastly, there's the confrontation part again that we just talked about. If you find yourself in a situation to where there's someone around that has a disability, I'm not, often, not all the time, but often, if you confront them with empathy and just say, hey, um, if you don't mind, I, just, I noticed that you have a disability and I'm just curious, what is the name of your disability? You no, know, and you know, and, and, and then introduce yourself. Tell, introduce yourself first. You know, tell them who you are, and then you know, tell them I'm interested in what your condition is. You know, and and let them know you're not trying to, you know, uh, be pessimistic or, you know, try to you know, do anything that to boast yourself. But uh, oftentimes, individuals are willing to share what information they do know. Uh, but like I said, you have to be kind of genuine. Like I said, no, no, that's why I say it's best to introduce yourself. Sometimes people just ask questions, what's wrong with you? No, don't, 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 don't do that. No, no, don't ask what's wrong with you. No, no, no. You know, that ain't going to go good after that. But, the first, but I think the probably the best option is, like I said, we got smartphones. Go on the internet, check these organizations out and reach out and get a First hand contact where you can get talk to someone, they probably send you pamphlets and everything, you know. So that, that's my take on it. I'm gonna let Dr. Dr. K give her what she would advise to do. I definitely agree with not saying what's wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just laughing because it happens more often than you would think. Yeah. Um, you know, people feel very entitled um, to address certain issues, especially, you know, even though I consider myself to have invisible chronic illness. Um, ironically, the weight gain for me with Cushing's was extremely visible. And uh, just a quick story, I was at a Walmart uh, a few years ago, and this was right before brain surgery, and a random stranger walked up to me, and I was with my sister, and the stranger walked up to us and said, you guys are sisters? It's like night and day. Why is she so skinny and you're so fat? What is wrong with you that you're so fat? And she's just going on and on about how fat I am. And this is a complete stranger in the middle of a Walmart. And so I quickly thought about what I, it was I was going to say. Um, my husband's like, why didn't you tell her she looked like a clown? I'm sorry, honey, but he, you know, he went there, he went to Team Petty, you know, and I was like, okay, I can understand that though, because, you know, it's very invasive and very rude. And, but what I did do was I responded and I said, 
Well, actually, I have a brain tumor that's causing me to be fat, as you put it. And when I get treatment for that, then perhaps I'll lose weight. And she was just mortified, absolutely mortified, because, you know, it was just a clear um, indication to her right away that there was definitely a boundary invasion there. Um, and it just wasn't right to approach me in that way. But the second thing that I will say in regards to that is we don't know every person's story. And so um, on top of piggybacking on, on uh, what Tyrone said about the vast amount of resources that we have out there, and of course in our virtual world now, um, it's important now more than ever to educate ourselves and this is what this is all about. But also I believe in, again, that there's power in people's voices, so I believe that when you ask people what their story is, most people will want to tell you what their story is. And I have another quick story. When I saw this cardiologist for the first time a couple years back, and it was at a teaching hospital, and she had her students with her and all of that, and I'm expected to be probed because of my unfortunate, some of my negative experience, um, probed and prodded and just, you know, sort of invaded upon, um, you know, and just treated as less than human. That was my expectation, unfortunately. But when she came in, students and all, the first thing she said to me was, Karen, tell me more about yourself. And I was completely floored and taken aback because that was the first time that a physician had said to me, I want to know your story. I want to know more about you. And it caused this openness where I was able to not only talk about my medical history, but also, you know, how that personally impacted me and my story. And she, over the years, has been able to learn more about these illnesses that she knew little about as a result. And so tell me your story, I think, is a really great way of showing people that you truly care about who they are. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay. Well, let's call uh, if anyone else has any more questions. I think we've done a really good job. Let's uh, call. Right, right, okay. I don't know why for that. I just want to make sure we get last call. Well, if I want to say before I let everyone go, uh, first of all, again, I, I, I know I said it's probably down time. Uh, Dr. Dr. J, Dr. K, thank you so much. Uh, those of you that don't know these these guys, I reached out to them. You know, we had like a week to put this together because, you know, my original plan it was just so hard to get up with those individuals, and I reached out to these. Uh, well, really, Dr. Dr. J, but uh, Dr. K was actually just brought on to me like, you know, that, that was such a blessing and. Uh, I, I, I can only imagine what Dr. J thought when she checked the email and saw someone asking, would you be a part of this panel? But anyway, it all worked out. And this right here is I've, out of the three we've done for the year. I really enjoyed this. We had a great turnout. Uh, I just want to say thank you on behalf of Community Heroes. I want to say thank you on behalf of my board members. I see we got some of my representatives here uh, in the panel. So again, thank you guys so much for supporting you know my vision supporting everything i want to do with community heroes and just being a part and helping me push this forward and uh just believing so um if you know, that, I, that's my spiel and uh again you can follow us uh this will be up pretty soon uh check our website out uh www.communityheroes.net uh and our facebook pages and our other social media uh platforms and uh, did you guys want to have one last word before i hit the stop record when i just want to say thank you tyrone for having me on it's been an honor and a privilege we believe that together we are epic and this is a reflection of that us coming together from different walks of life and just really trying to make a positive impact in the world 
So you're stuck with me from now on. So it's Community <laughs> Heroes. So I thank you so much. Um, and I just wanted to quickly, um, you know, send my love out to Sarah Yana, who, um, as you mentioned earlier, uh, was going to be on this panel, but um, had a family emergency and just want her to know that my thoughts are with you and your family. And, um, you know, thank you for having such a great impact on the community as well. And thank you, Dr. J. Um, you're stuck with me as well. Um, <laughs> so I really appreciate your perspective and the fact that I can tell that you're so very passionate about the work that you do. Thank you. So thank you, thank all of you. And thank you for everyone who attended today and, and all of your amazing comments. And, and back at you, Dr. K. I mean, I'm, I'm, I was hoping that you would say the same thing, that I'm stuck with you from now on. <laughs> so amazing. And yes, Tyrone, uh, you know, just second, just going to second what Dr. K said, I'm really honored and humbled to be a part of this panel. I've learned a lot and, and it's through stories. I use that Dr. K is where we can really connect and understand each other. And so I'm looking forward to more conversations. Uh, you know, just keep having the dialogue, uh, whether it's for awareness on rare disease or for mentoring or how we can help each other out and really, you know, uplift the community. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh,